In this video, I'll take you on the adventure oh, yeah. of transforming these old toys this is why they call me Mr. Fidget Spinner. <laughs> into five brand new musical instruments. After the build is complete, I will have a jam session with a few friends in the most musical place. So let's get into it. A fidget spinner is a little rotating toy. It's used to, well, fidget with, to calm the mind and relax. Or as the maker of this particular fidget spinner brand puts it, take your relax. Uh, okay. So why do I have so many fidget spinners? I had the ambition to make a kinetic sculpture based on magnets and bearings. I bought a bunch of fidget spinners of the local Dutch Craigslist equivalent for their bearings. However, I didn't succeed yet and for now I wanted to give it a rest. But now I have 48 fidget spinners. Then a question popped up in my head. Can I make an instrument with this? So this video has a little bit of a different format. Uh, normally I try to keep the videos really short because I don't want to overwhelm you but I feel like I might be withholding some cool stuff from you guys so this video is going to have a little bit more information and I'm curious to see if you like this new format with more information or if you prefer the older format which is more compact so let's get to it back to the question can i build an instrument with a fidget spinner i would need to use some kind of sensor to detect the motion of the spinner maybe an optical sensor can work i looked on aliexpress and found gated infrared switch sensors that could work then the spinner could go through this gate but then i saw infrared presence sensors these would be way easier to put in any assembly around the spinners. I was a bit worried if the sensor would be able to handle the speed of the fidget spinner. After all, they can rotate pretty fast and the sensor should give us a clear output at any speed. I did look at the datasheet of the sensor before I bought it, but it only described the onboard sensor, not the actual chip on the sensor board. So I just ordered one to do some initial testing with. Now that we have our sensor, I grabbed an Arduino and tried to generate some sound. Our first sound, alright. But it sounds terrible, so I went looking for libraries. I actually found several projects. Some of them were cumbersome or sounded bad or had very limited options. But one of them seemed amazing. The Mozzie project. So it says currently your Arduino can only beep like a microwave oven, which is exactly the point which we're at right now. I was blown away by what this library can do. There's an amplitude modulation, shaping and sample sequenced on the fly. Okay, so very promising. And I reached out to the maker of this library and he was also a very nice guy. So that's a plus as well. So let's make some sound with this. Okay, cool sounds. So now we need a rig. Something we can put our fidget spinner and our sensor in and then give it a whirl. Uh, pretty cool, right? I'll show you the trick to work out the speed of the fidget spinner in software in a moment. But first I want to brainstorm a little bit about what else we want this device to be able to do. So let's draw. We have a fidget spinner and we can control the sound it makes through knobs. And then we need power, so we'll add a power cord and a loudspeaker. And to make it fancier, it would be nice to have a jack output. And maybe we can use the USB connection to also send our MIDI information. I'll explain later what MIDI is exactly. So rather than using one fidget spinner, it would also be cool to use more so we can play specific notes. And this larger housing also gives us space to put more knobs in. Okay, and what if we put the fidget spinner in different positions? So we put them in a 3x3 three three grid and then we eliminate the middle one and replace it by a loudspeaker. Wouldn't that be cool? Given that most musical skills have seven notes and an eight one for an octave, this configuration gives us one fidget spinner for every note in a specific scale. All right, so which platform will we be running this on exactly? I showed an Arduino earlier and I have a lot of reason to use Arduinos. They have a lot of hardware shields available, software libraries and community support. And I feel like Arduino is still very strong in this department compared to other, maybe more powerful and fancy microcontrollers with nice DACs. I already found the Mozzie library for my initial test and it was a load of fun. So I wanted to keep going in this direction for sure. But first, 
which Arduino should I use? I'd like to use plug and play MIDI communication. So we need a native USB board. This means an Arduino Micro or Leonardo if we want the cheap boards. I also would like to have an IO shield available so I don't end up soldering too much. And these seem only available for the Uno, Nano and Mega boards. So these two don't actually overlap. So to solve my problem, I looked into the pinout of the Nano and Micro Arduinos and found out that for the pins that I need, there's only one difference. So I decided to go with the Arduino Micro and use the Arduino Nano IO shields. However, I only later realized what this was going to do to the USB-C connector position. It's now reversed, but by flipping the board, it's not that bad. Although there's a little bit of reaching involved when plugging in the USB cable now. So I just showed you this demo. So here I'm actually using the speed of the fidget spinner, but how did I get this speed? Well, basically speed is some unit divided by some unit of time. For example, meters per second. In our case, we have a sensor which can say, I see a fidget spinner, or I don't. Let's call every time we don't see a fidget spinner and then it appears, one count. So this will mean that one rotation would give us three counts. Okay, so now we have a formula for our angular frequency. The last thing we need is the maximum speed this thing can turn. So I spun it as fast as I could, and I recorded with my iPhone slow motion function at 240 FPS. And then I measured for 10 seconds, just the amount of rotations. After I was done, I corrected my measurement for the slow motion and I divided the result by 10 seconds. And that gave me a maximum fidget spinner speed of 13 Hertz or around 40 pulses per second. So in signal processing, there's one very important theorem called the Nyquist-Shannon sampling theorem, which basically says that we need to sample at least at twice at the signal bandwidth. If we don't do this, we might run into the scary issue of aliasing. Ah! This means we measure a low frequency while the actual frequency is higher than what we can even measure. So you see this a lot on television with the helicopter blades. They look like they start rotating backwards after a while, well, that's the same thing. So our signal is basically 40 Hertz, so we need to sample at at least 80 Hertz. I put it on 128 and this worked perfectly. Now it's time to scale it up. I made a holder for eight fidget spinners and added a bunch of knobs. Now I could add all the final electronics. After this was done, I kept adding different sounds, modes, effects and controls as the project went on. Are you okay? Go home or do we know you're drunk? I was satisfied with the layout of the spinners, so now I could make a case. I made sure the frame I had fitted in the new case. I was lucky enough that the case fit exactly on my 3D print bed. But I also considered grabbing some yellow acrylic panels and using the laser cutter to make a frame. I'm actually running a 0.8mm nozzle on my Prusa Mark II now, since it prints faster and the resulting parts are a bit stronger. The look of the prints is a bit different, but I like it. The Mark II didn't come with a 0.8mm profile, so I had to make one myself and ran into some issues. But after I copied the 0.8mm profile from a newer printer and adjusted it where necessary, I was good to go. This frame was super sturdy, but took a huge amount of filament to print. So I decided to slim it down for the next version. And I wanted a closed lid on the frame, so I designed that too. From this point on, I numbered the frames. Serial 001 had a bunch of small issues, mostly tolerances, which weren't exactly right. Serial 2 was almost perfect, and Serial 3, 4 and 5 are my final designs. As you can imagine, this took a lot of filament to print, so I had to switch the spool at one point. I tried to swap it mid-print, and I actually missed the extruder insert. So we're missing one line in this, uh, in this print. Okay. I tried to keep the electronics as simple as possible. I don't like soldering, so I tried to have as many of the parts with standard connectors. The infrared sensors were okay, but I couldn't find anything for the pot meter, so I ended up soldering quite a lot anyway. Holy cow! I found a nice amplifier which works on 5 volts, so we don't need an additional power supply for the amplifier. The trickiest part of the electronics was the headphone output. I wish this would have been integrated into the amplifier module. I'll explain more about the headphone output in a little bit. So I'd read somewhere that putting a capacitor in series with the PWM output should improve audio quality. And to control headphone current, I added a 10K resistor in series also. 
I'm pretty sure my friends that are working in an advanced amplifier design would murder me if they would see this. But for me, it's a case of making it good enough. So comments about how it should be done are welcome. The headphone switch is an interesting piece of equipment. Have you ever wondered, in the bygone age of wired headphones, that when you plugged headphones into a device which also featured a loudspeaker, how the speaker would be muted? Well, it turns out there's actually a little switch inside the headphone port. Basically, when you insert the headphone jack, you're breaking a connection between the signal and the speakers and rerouting it to the headphones. There are a bunch of different types. Some have no switches and some have several. The ones I ordered have two switches and are transparent on the outside, so you can actually see the mechanism working. I think this is really cool. So one unfortunate thing I discovered is that sunlight and lamps can have an influence on the sensors. With bright sunlight the instrument becomes hard to use, which is weird because the datasheet of the sensor clearly shows that it's daylight blocking. Mm-hmm. Well, that's a bummer. Another issue that I haven't been able to fix is that when you really quickly increase or decrease the volume of the amplifier, sometimes the uh, Arduino resets. Which is weird because this amp should only draw 3 watts. Even with a 2.3 amp power supply this problem still persists. I even added a capacitor on the power supply but it didn't work. So my workaround is not to increase the volume too fast. It's bad but I don't know the solution. If you do please leave it down in the comments below. And as you can hear this amplifier is pretty terrible. Let me crank it up. So at this point you might be wondering. Why am I always powering my projects through USB? Well, for lower power projects, it's just really easy. You can power your projects with a power bank, a phone charger, a laptop, or anything carrying a USB port. And the Arduinos I like to use take 5 volt anyway, so it's quick, easy, and versatile. The part of this project that took me the longest time to develop is the software. I ended up using 99% of the available program storage of this microcontroller. I couldn't even add my debug statements with print line anymore. To help with all things related to notes and skills, I used the Arduino Meteor library, which is very nice. I love what the Meteor library and Mozilla library are able to accomplish and only scratch the tip of the iceberg of what they're capable of. I don't want to go over the full code here. It's there, some parts are really pretty and some are ugly, but it works. And you can go check it out on GitHub if you like. You can find the link in the description down below. So something I noticed while building this project was that a speed-based pitch synth wouldn't be all that useful in practice. It would most often be off-pitch and not play nice with other instruments. So I didn't use the spinner velocity in the arpeggiator playstyle that you have been hearing before. But I did use it for the note volumes in chord mode and in the speed-based demo mode, where the pitch of the played notes is controlled by the total velocity of all spinners. This is nice, but it's mostly a gimmick, so I like the first two playstyles the most. Okay, so I owe you an explanation of what MIDI can do. Look at this. I'm generating notes on our instrument and through the USB connection I'm sending them to a computer where I'm running musical creation software. And there it's actually controlling a different synthesizer. Cool! We can also use the speed of one of the fidget spinners, or all eight of them, to control parameters of, for example, a filter or an effect on the computer. So we can use our knobs in the same way, so if I rotate it here on the computer it will actually control uh, some parameter of a synthesizer or of an effect. Let me show you in under one minute how to make an Arduino MIDI controller for yourself. Grab an Arduino with an Atmega 32U4 chip. They have native USB. Open the Arduino application and install the USB MIDI library. Then go to the USB MIDI GitHub page and check the midi-control.ino example file. Copy the code and paste it into your Arduino sketch. And modify it where it's necessary. In my case I have one digital switch and no analog switch. Then set the input switch type to input pull up. This means to make a makeshift switch you only need two wires, one on the ground and one on digital pin 2. If you connect them, the switch is closed, and if you open them, the switch is open. Now open an application on your PC that can handle MIDI instructions and hear the sound and bada bing bada boom, you've made your own MIDI controller using Arduino. 
So before, I didn't use any versioning of my Arduino code since it's generally pretty small. Versioning tools help you see the changes that you made to your code, merge your changes with other collaborators, and give tools to refer to older versions or selectively apply changes that you made to the code base. This project has 760 lines of code, so I started using Git for versioning, and it's been wonderful. If I break something, I can easily return it to a working state and see the changes I made. I will be using this tool for all my upcoming projects. I also want to give a shout out to Octoprint. Octoprint is a tool to remotely control your 3D printer. It even integrates into my smart home application so I can check my 3D printing jobs everywhere. This saved me so much hassle during this project. So in the end, how does it all work? What is every knob for? So this one is pitch. This one is the skill mode, so which skill are we playing? Tempo. Tempo multiplier. The yellow knob controls the playstyle, so arpeggiator, chords, or speed based. Then the sound, so sine, triangle, sawtooth, square, or bamboo sampled. Lopez filter, tremulator, glitch, and distortion. I had arranged to meet up some old friends at what I've heard is Europe's biggest guitar shop. They needed to have their guitar serviced and maybe buy a new one, and I was looking forward to hanging out. I had just finished the instrument and figured that it would actually be an amazing place to take my instrument and show it to them. The people at the store were super friendly and they showed us to a room we could use. So this is really quick. Wow, well, cool. Something unique you created. <laughs> Thank you. You want us to uh, make some music with it? Yeah, let's try. You can grab a guitar. I mean, I think yeah. they have guitars here, right? Somewhere? Yeah, I think Did you see any? Oh, look, there's one right now. Okay, let's wrap up the video. I'm completely blown away by how much I've been able to put on one Arduino. Real-time MIDI, audio generation and fidget spinner encoder readouts. 98%, actually 99% of the Arduino's program memory is actually in use. All in all, this was an amazing making adventure, but I'm happy it's done. I took on more work than I could reasonably handle in one month, so my next video will probably be a bit simpler. I'm thinking of showing you my workshop and tools in the next video. Let me know if you're interested in that in the comments down below or what else you would like to see. Even though it was a lot of hard work to come up with all the electronics, software and mechanical parts, I've decided to give away all the designs, code and electronic schematics for free. So you can make this instrument too and as cheaply as possible. But if you would like to support the channel, I also made four copies that you saw in this video, which are for sale. Ordering the parts, doing assembly, soldering, testing, it was a lot of work. Each unit that I built has a unique serial number on the inside and outside and is signed by me. Besides owning a unique musical instrument, you'll also be supporting the channel with your purchase. If you're interested, you can send a message to the email address that's listed on my about page, right here on YouTube. 
As always, I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you do, please hit that subscribe button, post a comment and share the video with your friends. I would love to be able to keep making videos like this and I need your support to do so. Okay, until next time. Oh, and if you haven't watched me making the garbage wine bottle playing machine, you should check it out next.